start off with a, a presentation from the former organizer of a really incredible organization, an organization that inspired me when I was on city council. I still remember the sit-in they did in council chambers that brought council to a halt. It was really fabulous. And that's Jennifer Epstein and Yuli Chan with the bus riders here. Um, thank you to COPE for inviting us to come speak. Um, my name is Jennifer Efting, and as Kim said, uh, I'm a former organizer with the Vancouver Bus Riders Union. Um, the Bus Riders Union is no longer active, uh, but I will just, uh, I think it's instructive though to look at what the BRU was and what kind of work we did. Um, uh, to sort of look at where we should, m you know, maybe look at going in terms of pursuing transportation policy. Um, the Bus Riders Union was founded in 2001 during a four-month transit strike, um, and it was founded out of a forum that was held in Vancouver um, called More Buses, Lower Fares um, that was hosted by the Canadian Auto Workers and the uh, Labour the Labor Community Strategy, the Labor Community Strategy Center, and the Labor Environmental Alliance uh, that was out of Vancouver. Um, so out of that, there was a decision to start a bus riders union in Vancouver, and the organizers that started it explicitly were coming from anti-poverty, anti-capitalist, and feminizing feminist organizing experience. So we were looking at the project of the bus riders union through that explicit uh, sort of class conscious. Um, anti-racist and anti-sexist analysis from the start. Um, we were inspired by the Bus Riders Union in Los Angeles, which is a very dynamic organization um, that also sort of looked at the bus from that explicit uh, class and anti-racist position. Um, and uh, so we got a lot of mentorship from them from the get-go. Um, and what they they put forward the bus as the idea of as, as a factory on wheels. So in a time like where the economy is explicitly dividing workers um, physically, so you know more workers being displaced to different um, you know different workplaces, harder to organize unions. Um, um, workers are divided, sort of in this sort of way, but on the bus workers are sort of physically put together. So is that an opportunity to come together and organize around a concrete issue that impacts, you know, the low-income uh, low working class within a city? Um, which we also were very inspired by. So uh, one of the sort of benchmarks of what the BRU was about, uh, both in Los Angeles and in Vancouver, was sort of going onto the buses and politicizing that space. So um, coming on, we would come onto the bus and we were wearing bright orange t-shirts. We would say we're from the Bus Riders Union and we would talk to the bus riders. Both, we would make announcements from the front of the bus and we would talk to them individually about what campaign we were working on. And the campaigns that we were working on would go from anything from stop transit racism. So that would be from the idea that um, when TransLink divests money from the bus system and puts it into things like uh, the SkyTrain, that that's actually a form of systemic racism. And we would talk to bus riders about what that means. Um, we would say end transit sexism. Um, women in transit put women at the center of transportation planning um, um, to say that when women can't access public transportation, that that actually increases their vulnerability to violence. Um, we would have campaigns also around things like lowering bus fares and increasing buses to uh, 500 buses. Um, we explicitly organized around the bus rather than just around uh, transit because we 
Uh, we, we knew at that time, and I don't think it's really changed very much, although I'm sure I could be corrected by the numerous transportation planners if I'm wrong, but uh, like 80% of transit dependent people ride the bus. They don't, you know, either to, for a, some part of their trip, right? So they need the bus to get to SkyTrain, right? So the whole idea that, that rail is gonna solve the problem, we never really bought that sort of as an organization. Um, and we liaised with the Canadian Auto Workers, the dr Bus Drivers Union, in order to do that work. So we did that on an organizational level, um, getting support from them when we would organize fare strikes. Um, and we would do it one-on-one -on -one with the bus drivers and we'd, we would get on the bus. We wouldn't just flounce past them <laughs> and start talking to riders. We would talk to the driver first. Um, tell him what we were doing and engage with them um, and make sure they knew what we were talking about. And, um, um, and they were often very supportive. Sometimes they weren't, but <laughs> they were often very supportive because they knew who was riding their buses every day. They were on the buses too. Um, so that was the kind of work that we did. Um, we had quite a bit of success. We, I would say we stopped organizing in around 2008. Uh, we ended up with an organization of about 3,000 members. We were a mass organization, so we built, um, we were democratic and we were based uh, on a sort of a membership model. Um, so we would go on the bus and part of what we were doing is asking people to sign um, a membership form. So we developed a membership base of about 3,000 people. Um, we won back late night buses in 2003. So there had been a cut to late night bus service. So we ran a campaign called Late Night Buses and the Curfew Now, um, where we uh, went on the buses. We did late night bus rides. Um, we did community meetings. We developed a document that we presented to TransLink. We brought, brought bus riders to TransLink meetings en masse to talk to um, TransLink about what their decisions were meaning. Um, because you know what, the same thing is happening now in terms of how bus riders are presented as this sort of hooligan mass, right? And it's not, what, what we were talking about with the, the, um, the bus riders union at the end the curfew now campaign is like, it's not just people going to parties that ride late night buses. And I, I'm sure it's obvious to everybody in this room, but it, at the time when it was happening, that was the dynamic and the, that was the dialogue coming forward from the TransLink communications officers is like, these are just kids that are going to raves or something late at night, right? So we um, engaged TransLink to say like, it's not just people that are going to parties, it's late night workers and here they are and they're gonna talk to you about what this means for their lives. Um, so uh, those were some of the successes. We also organized two fair strikes um, where we organized TransLink, trans, uh, we organized transit riders en masse on the buses not to pay um, their fares. And those were widely successful and super fun and very stressful. <laughs> but uh, they were really great actions and at those times we, um, for the first one in particular, we had the Canadian Auto Workers, the Vice President Jim Houlihan, um, actually out on the streets talking to drivers around, you know, not to get in confrontations with us. I mean, they had to be very careful that they would not be seen to be supporting, and you know, because they don't. That would be an illegal job action on their part, right? So it's one thing for bus riders to say they're not going to pay, but it's another thing for a driver to say no problemo, right? So um, that was a very successful and fun action. Um, and it was all part of sort of this way of look, we wanted to look at organizing in a creative way. And we wanted to um, expand people's imagination of what was possible. So that's a lot of the demands that we would come up with, that's what we were trying to do. What would it look like if we had a completely socially just transportation system? What would it look like if we centered women in transit? Um, and so that's how we came up with a lot of our demands and a lot of our campaigns. So I think I'll probably end it there. And Yuli's going to talk a little bit more about our work. So 
Yeah, Jen kind of touched on the, um, the, the practice of the Bus Murders Union, but um, you know, the, the practice was really guided by a whole framework um, that we worked to develop over the years. Um, we saw public transit as a point of working class struggle to really highlight the ways in which um, poor and marginalized people are negatively affected by neoliberal policies, and in transit it was mainly through privatization. So while Translate was giving away lu lucrative contracts to companies like SNC Lapland, which I'll talk a little bit more about later, um, bus riders were and still are in urgent need of a low cost and efficient public <coughs> transportation system. So even in a relatively small city um, like Vancouver, um, compared to other big, bigger cities like Toronto or LA, um, for transit dependent people who are commuting, um, it takes up a significant part of our day, and those who can afford a vehicle or can at least en enjoy the luxury of sitting in their cars and turn turning on the radio, staying warm, or turning up you know, the AC. But for bus riders, most of us have to commute at least one to two hours each way on overcrowded buses. Uh, we have to endure long waits, miss transfers, and deal with the constant stress of being late for work and loss of leisure time. And this eventually takes a real toll on their quality of life. So while the Bus Riders Union um, was organizing to make improvements in people's lives, we also had long-term goals and a vision, which Jen was talking about. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what were some of our guiding principles at the time. The first one was to build a multiracial working class organization. Um, like Jen was saying, the bus was really this factory on wheels, uh, bringing people to and from work most of the time, and we really saw a very diverse representation of people on the buses, um, mainly working class, uh, you know, juggling two or three different jobs, lots of single moms, um, Aboriginal people, um, immigrants and refugees. And so what we really wanted to do was transform this really um, unique space and, and moment into a place of uh, public dialogue and conversation. And so through organizing on the buses, we wanted to have people share their experiences um, of oppression and exploitation. And um, I remember getting on the bus and talking to lots of bus riders about what they were doing, where they were going, and other people would hear and they would jump in and say, you know, that's that's interesting because I also share that same experience. So it was really uh, about transforming this very alienated culture that we have into a, a, a small piece of a very um, engaging and democratic, I think, moment um, in, in, a people, in a person's daily life. Um, and so through that, we really wanted to unite the working class in a, around a common issue and in a common experience. Our second guiding uh, principle or overall goal was to really develop leadership among marginalized people. I mean, we just, you know, at the end of the day, all we do is most of us just work or go to school and we don't really get a chance to really think about the bigger things, the bigger picture. And so um, part of what the Bus Riders Union did through things like organizing the fare strikes um, and going to, you know, city hall meetings and shutting them down. Um, you know, we also facilitated people to um, speak to TransLink directly, um, and it's very rare that we do that now, and I think that was a very important thing that we were able to do was to actually bring the democratic process to the people and say, this is your opportunity to have a say in what is happening in your life and what is happening um, in your community, and you have a chance, and we're going to do everything we can to make this happen. And so we were able to bring bus riders to um, TransLink's monthly meetings, and you know they they did everything they could to avoid having us at those meetings. They would rotate the location of those meetings to Langley, to Coquitlam, Port Moody, you know, completely out of the way and inaccessible for bus riders. But we still manage to get there and have our three minutes per person um, and have our say. So developing leadership, I think, was really important. Um, we also aim to develop an anti-racist and anti-sexist class consciousness among 
uh, bus riders because it was very clear that you know these policies had a disproportionate um, <coughs> impact on um, people of color, um, Aboriginal people, on women. Um, and it was important also, you know, at that time, the presence of the SkyTrain police was really increasing. Um, and the issue of racial profiling and criminalization of people of color actually impacts everyone in the transit system when you think about it. Um, it normalizes a culture of surveillance and policing. It takes away people's sense of entitlement to accessing a public service in a space. Um, and even now, you know, they're constantly talking about increasing powers to the SkyTrain police. And so, um, you know, we really wanted to ask TransLink, what does real safety look like? Does it mean actually that you put more cops in the system or do you actually make service more reliable? Um, you put more lighting in bu at bus stops late at night. Um, so we really challenge what TransLink wanted to put forward to us as security. Um, the third thing, or sorry, the last thing was actually building uh, solidarity with local and international organizations of working class people. So um, we were able to join with other local organizations and unions um, and, and struggle against other neoliberal um, impacts and policies. Um, we joined with local struggles um, and international struggles as much as possible. We marched with anti-war protesters, with women's groups, with immigrants and refugee rights organizations. And like Jan was saying, we really try to create a relationship of solidarity between bus riders and bus drivers because at the end of the day, we're still all part of the working class. Um, and we really didn't want to deepen the feelings of animosity that were often there between um, bus riders and bus drivers. Um, and so, two minutes, okay. Um, so, uh, in terms of the bus riders union, um, you know, we found that there were so many other intersecting issues um, with public transit. Um, environmental justice and public health was a really big part of our call within our demands. Um, clearly, public transit is fundamental to our community and environmental health, and I'm sure the rest of the speakers are going to cover that. Um, and so, we really put forward to TransLink that bus riders are actually environmental leaders when you think about it. We're the ones that are actually reducing the most amount of um, emissions, greenhouse emissions in, in the city. And so rather than punishing us with high fares, you really should be giving us greater incentives um, to take public transit. Um, we really also push for the, uh, the defense and expansion of public services. Um, we call for TransLink to place women's needs at the center of public policy. Um, according to Stats Canada, women are more likely than men to depend on a bus to get to and from work, to depend on somebody else for a ride to work, and so women clearly have a huge stake in public transit. The last issue was, um, and I've already kind of touched on it, was that we really saw TransLink's policies of privatization having a disproportionate impact on people of color. Um, Jen already talked about the Night Owls campaign and the issue of racial profiling. Um, the last point that I wanted to just kind of bring up was <coughs> the Bus Riders Union really, um, one of our main campaigns was against the Canada Line, which is obviously now in uh, here. But uh, at the time, what was really important about that campaign was making the link between um, neoliberalism and war. Uh, the company that built the Canada Line was SNC Laughlin, which is a well-known war profiteering company. And I just wanted to share a story. I was on the <coughs> bus one time with the Bus Riders Union, and I was talking to a bus rider about um, TransLink con uh, TransLink's contract with SNC Laughlin um, and how they were um, they had many services and, and um, uh, construction projects in Afghanistan. And after I explained it, he said to me, "I know what you're talking about." I'm from Afghanistan, and I had to leave my country when the war started. And so it became really clear that, you know, that our governments really didn't have our best interests on their agenda. And, and by that I mean the interests of working class people. Um, our governments were giving away billions of dollars to a war profiteering company at home and abroad. And so we realized that our struggle against privatization um, in, in happening in public transit uh,
was really rooted in our local government shifting priorities from public services to increasing profits and militarization, and that's why we always saw our fight as a broader uh, struggle against international. Um, uh, it was in for the defense of human, political, economic, and social rights. Thank you. Very